الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين My dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And may Allah reward you all and the organizers for giving me that great pleasure of being amongst you today uh, There were basically two topics assigned to me for this uh, forum this year one deals with Salah, and the other deal with the preservation of the Qur'an. Um, to begin with, as you see on the um, screen, the basic outline for presentation begins with some introduction. It goes on to address the so-called internal evidence within the Qur'an itself of its preservation. Thirdly, we look at the external evidence by examining the three major stages in which the Quran was uh, preserved at the time of the Prophet وسلم, Abu Bakr and Osman. In the fourth topic or sub area, depending on the time available, we might touch at least on some of the objections raised by um, Western scholars or Orientalists or others and respond to a few at least of them and a conclusion, inshallah. In the following uh, slide, we begin with the introduction, which makes basically three points. First of all, that there are two primary sources for Islam. All others are regarded as secondary. The two primary sources are the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet The reason they are called primary is that both of them are revelatory in nature. They are based on the revelation either in word and meaning as is the case with the Qur'an or revelation of meaning with the Prophet using his own words as we find in Hadith or Sunnah. The second major point then is that <coughs> in addition to their importance being primary sources, the Quran has had a great impact on history. It changed the lives of countless millions of people who embraced Islam. And it did influence the whole world, even Islamic and non-Islamic world. The Quran was the moving and dynamic force behind uh, those changes. And until today, as you may hear of the stories of some of those who came to Islam, like Yusuf Islam and others, that oftentimes it began even by reading an interpretive translation of the meaning of the Quran, like Yusuf Ali and others, which does not even fully capture the original Quran yet. It was sufficient in many cases to make a lot of people uh, see the light. Now, to speak in one session about preservation and Quran, of the Qur'an and Hadith is a bit too ambitious. So I thought for maximum benefit to just focus on the Qur'an and not the whole Qur'an again. Why? When we speak about primary sources and when we try to learn how to respond to objections and all the campaign to discredit Islam, its teaching, its prophet, and its book, then we need, in fact, to make sure of two things. First, how do we know that the Quran indeed is the word of Allah? What to say to those who say the Quran is just a book that was written by a group of people similar to the various authors of the Bible, for example? or that the Qur'an was written by Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as you find typically in most social studies books, Qur'an written by Muhammad. If they don't say it directly even, they quote ayat in the Qur'an and says Muhammad said, and they quote the Qur'an, implying that he uh, was the author. Or those who say that the Qur'an basically is a sort of uh, compilation from various sources, because there are similarities between the Quran and Bible and other sources, apocryphal literature even. So what the Prophet must have done is simply to study all of this and 
sort of make a term paper incorporating all of these. That's what we call perhaps the issue of authority of the Quran. And again, that requires a separate presentation itself, even in the most superficial way, it requires a whole session. But that was not the topic really assigned to me. The other aspect of ascertaining uh, why the Quran is very important for Muslims and why it's, it's, it's not just a matter of authority, but also authenticity. By that we mean, well, suppose the Quran is proven to be the word of Allah and there is lots of evidence to that effect. How do we know that the Quran we have today is the same as uttered by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Without editing, without tampering, without addition or deletion. Both the issues of authority and authenticity of the Quran are usually referred to, along with other sciences, as the sciences, in plural, of the Quran, which include, beside these two issues, pertaining to tafsir, occasion of revelation, naskh, which I like to translate as supersession rather than abrogation, and many other areas, the div division of Makki and Madani revelations. There, this is a huge field uh, in itself. I just want to give a sort of outline only. So that basically sets the parameters or show where the topic today fit as a humble little point in a whole spectrum of areas pertaining to the Quran. In the second uh, sub area, I just wanted to address first, if we can move that down, please and move that up, the internal evidence. This is something which is acceptable in scholarly circles of Islamic studies, biblical studies, and other, that before you analyze anything, look first as to whether a claim is made internally, whether we, we deal with authority or authenticity. We're focusing on authenticity. That's the question should come first. Not that this is sufficient, because anyone can write anything and put any evidence in that, but as a beginning point. So the basic question we have here, number one, is there any evidence in the Quran itself, from within the Quran, that it will be preserved. First of all, we note that we do have explicit and clear statements in the Quran that it, Ill, it will be preserved. And the Surah and Ayah number that you see on the screen, 15.9, is only one example, but it's one of the oft repeated and quoted ayahs from the Quran, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ You must have heard that many times. It is we means Allah. We here is the plural of majesty, not a committee of gods. It's we who revealed the reminder. Reminder is a reference to the Quran. And it is we, Allah, that we're going to take care of preserving it. Like I said, this is only one. You find other ayat in the Quran. وَإِنَّهُ لَكِتَابٌ عَزِيزٌ لَا يَأْتِيهِ الْبَاطِلُ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَلَا مِنْ خَلْفِهِ تَنْزِيلٌ مِنْ حَكِيمٍ حَمِيدٌ That's in, uh, in Surah 41. We find evidence also uh, when the Prophet وسلم, used to speed up with recitation after Jibreel when he dictates the Quran to him. He was afraid that he might miss a word. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assured the Prophet, as we see in Surah Taha, in Surah 20, in Ayah 114, Don't hasten with the Quran before its revelation is completed to you, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and say, O Allah, increase me in knowledge. But there is something also pertaining directly to preservation that we find in Surah 75, in Ayah 16. That's even much more revealing. It says to the Prophet Sallallahu Don't move your tongue in haste concerning it. That means the Quran. <coughs> it is up to us, means to Allah, Jam'ahu wa Qur'ana, to preserve it and to uh, promulgate it. So as far as the evidence in the Quran, these are only uh, examples of many. But in what sense 
was the promise made in the Quran for its preservation. Here we find evidence internally of the dual promise of preserving the Quran. First of all, memory, which is even more important, much more important. It is interesting to notice, for example, that in one hadith in Muslim, in Sahih Muslim, uh, it is said that the Prophet ﷺ was told that you will be given a Quran which will not be erased with water because that's the way sometimes when they write in something and then they want to clean it, they wash it with water to write again. And some people did not pay enough attention to this that forget even about any written record of the Quran. The promise is that this Quran can never disappear. You can burn all copies of the Quran in the world. You can erase any manuscript, but the Quran would remain. For example, the first citation in Surah An-Nur, Surah 24, we are told quite clearly that the Quran would be preserved mainly in the hearts of people. بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ وَلَيْسَ فِي كُتُبِ بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ the Quran is nothing but clear signs in the hearts. Didn't say books, even though writing will come. But that particular one focus in the hearts, sudur, those who are given uh, knowledge. I put that first because I think it's the, even the more important one. Yet we find evidence in the Quran also of its preservation in writing. There are numerous references to that. In uh, Surah Al-Alaq, Iqra' Bismi Rabbik. I know the word Iqra' could mean read and recite, but as you know, in some narration, it says that Jibreel alayhi salam brought a parchment and asked the Prophet alayhi salam to read. But if you continue with the first few ayahs in Surah 96, Al-Alaq, Alladhi allama bil qalam, in the context of the Quran, it says that Allah taught the human with the pen. So that also a reference to writing. In Surah 98, Describe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Rasulun min Allahi yatlu suhufan mutahara fiha kutubun qayyima A messenger from Allah reciting suhuf means leaves containing uh, valuable books Describing the Quran in Surah 80 also that it is bi'aydi safara kiramin barara would be written or recorded by the hands of uh, righteous, honorable uh, scribes. So I, I think, again, that should be quite enough to articulate that second point. But now let me come to a controversial question that very frequently comes and is faced by Muslims living among uh, Christians and Jews. Some people would say, you're trying to tell us that God promised to preserve his word, the Quran, he said yes. But doesn't your own Quran also say that what was revealed to Musa and Isa, peace be upon them both, and other prophets, was also the word of Allah? As a Muslim, what can you say? Yes, it was the word of Allah. Why is it that Allah did not choose to preserve his word, and you people claim that all other scriptures did not remain intact as the Quran did. Why did God choose to preserve some of his words but not the others? An interesting question, isn't it? You must have heard that. First of all, you can dismiss it with one very quick answer, but I'd like to elaborate a little more on that. The answer to that is that what do you mean by word of Allah? Do you mean that it has to be specifically in uh, having a title of a book that some people even might have given to the scripture, the word Bible itself, to my knowledge, was not uttered by the name of any prophets, prophet before. Turayes, maybe, that was mentioned both in the Bible and the Quran, that this is true. But the word Bible, for example, did not come. When we speak about the word of Allah, means his revelation, his guidance to mankind. That guidance could have come or did come uh, in some form as revealed to one prophet 
it was elaborated or repeated through another prophet. So when you speak about the Quran as the last preserved word of Allah and revelation from Allah, it is the word of Allah preserved. You see what I mean? In other words, even if people neglected to preserve the word of Allah, ultimately Allah preserved it because you, if you talk about the scale of time, the prophetic missions and the series and sequence of revelations throughout history, ultimately the word of Allah is preserved in the Quran. The fact that at some point or the other people forgot some parts or changed some parts did not really touch on the essential message that Allah sent to mankind. Even if you take some basic concepts, the issue, for example, of the Tawheed or the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in spite of all the changes that might have taken place in previous scriptures, even you go on today to the Old Testament or Hebrew scripture, as Jews like to call it, or to the, to the New Testament and the Quran, and you find the word of Allah in essence has been preserved. Even in all three, it speaks about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That would be a simple way to answer the question. But something really attracts attention when the Quran gives a more explicit and detailed answer to that question. You read in the Quran, Inna anzalna tawrata fiha hudan wa nur. That's in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah 5 and Ayah 47. Inna anzalna tawrata fiha hudan wa nur. Yahkumu biha al-nabiyyuna al-ladhina aslamu lil-ladhina hadu wal-rabbaniyuna wal-ahbaru bima stuhfidhu. Notice that word. Bima stuhfidhu min kitab illahi wa kanu alayhi shuhada. The free translation of the meaning. Allah says we indeed reveal the Torah containing light and guidance used as a basis for judgment by the rabbis and the scholars or doctors of law, those who submitted to Allah, alladhina aslamu, for those who were Jews and the other scholars, al-ahbar, by virtue of the fact that they were given the responsibility of preserving the book of Allah. This is very crucial. They, by virtue of being given the responsibility to preserve the word of Allah. You can see the difference now, don't you? So prior to the revelation of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the responsibility for its preser preservation or preservation of his word and revelation to the learned people, human beings. Human beings have their own shortcomings and they have their failings and they failed. There's no question that they failed. In the case of the Quran, since it has to culminate and preserve the essence of the word of God, Allah decided that no more will that responsibility be given to human beings. Being the last revelation, being the last book, I myself is going to take care of it. So there is absolutely no inconsistency between statements in the Quran about validity of previous revelation that conformed to the Quran and the fact that the word of Allah ultimately was preserved through the Quran. I hope that would be enough to answer that one. Now we go to the third sub area and that's perhaps the major part of the presentation. Even though since the topic is rather technical, I try to simplify it as best as possible, and maybe during discussion we could elaborate. If this is the case, in what stages then, from the historic standpoint, can we uh, refer to the Quran as to how it was preserved? Well, obviously, the first uh, stage was during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the first thing we notice, and I'll come to that point again toward the end, is the widespread memorization of the Quran. In fact, multitudes of people memorized the entire Quran, multitudes memorized major parts of the Quran, and like I say, we'll come back to that again. There's no question about that. The, there are mutawatir information. Mutawatir means information that are coming consistently through a variety of sources or variety of chains of narration that support the fact that the Quran was preserved. Indeed, as the Quran itself says, fi sudur, in the heart of people. And this might sound rather strange, especially for our, uh, you know, Jewish and Christian friends who uh, 
have never heard, I have never heard personally, of anyone throughout the entire human history who memorizes the Bible from A to Z, word for word. It doesn't exist. You know, so that the, the, this is something that is rather amazing and unique about the Quran. The second point is that we find in numerous sound and authentic ahadith that it was the custom of Jibreel alayhi salam to come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam every Ramadan during the last 10 days during his i'tikaf and reviews with him what has been revealed in the entire Quran up to that point of time. It was narrated also that in the last year of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu the last Ramadan, his i'tikaf extended to the last 20 days of Ramadan and Jibreel reviewed the Quran with him twice instead of once. And interestingly enough, and that's related to another point that's coming, you know who, who was with the Prophet Sallallahu during these reviews? Was Zaid the chief scribe of Revelation. So that settles that issue. Then we come to the question of the scribes. And in spite of the misunderstanding that some people given or superficial interpretation of some ahadith that might give the impression that there were only four or seven scribes of Revelation, we find that both Muslim and even many non-Muslim scholars admit that you get lots of reports about scribes of revelation, which includes uh, in some cases as many as 40, in some cases as many as 52 names of people who wrote or were charged of writing revelation to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Secondly, we go to the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an. And first of all, we ask, what was the occasion for Abu Bakr contribution to the preservation of the Quran if the entire Quran was memorized and committed to writing at the time of the Prophet what exactly did Abu Bakr do here we must remember that while the entire Quran was written down it was not all collected in one place or under the same roof and in fact memorization would have been sufficient and you'll see that from the dialogue that went on between Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma. As you know, as soon as Abu Bakr became Khalifa, immediately there was that rebellion that some historian call Hurub al ridda the apostasy wars. Whether we have reservation on the term itself or not, but we all know that there have been big commotions and there have been some people who embraced Islam in a very superficial way and with the death of the Prophet sallam, they just started to get loose and the whole structure of the state and order was threatened. As a result, in one of those uh, battles known as the Battle of Yamama, it was reported that 70 of the memorizers of the Quran were martyred. And by the way, that's a further evidence that memorization was not limited to a few. Just in one battle, 70 memorizers were martyred. And these are not all the memorizers. So Umar radiallahu an went to Abu Bakr and he said to him, I am afraid if that situation continues and more and more memorizers of the Quran get martyred, that sometimes down in the future, the Quran could get lost. Maybe he wasn't quite sure whether memory alone, alone would be enough. It's just the great care they wanted to give to the preservation of the book of Allah. So Umar, Abu Bakr asked him, what do you want me to do then? Well, he said, uh, you should collect all the manuscripts, verify it, and have it all under one roof so that you have the whole volume of the Quran in one place. And Abu Bakr hesitates. And he tells Umar, why should we do something that the Prophet didn't do? But Umar, again, with his fiqh, his understanding and skill, tell him that, yes, if the Prophet didn't do it, but there is something which is beneficial to Muslims. So he kept influencing Abu Bakr until Allah opened Abu Bakr's heart to this idea. Then Abu Bakr called no less than Zaid, who was the chief scribe of Revelation and who was the prophet during these last reviews. He said to him, you're a young man and we have no accusation whatsoever against you and you used to write Revelation for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
So go around and collect all those manuscripts, verify it, and put it in one place. What was the methodology used by Zaid and his committee? He's not the only one. It was public. Actually, it said that Umar went around and said, anyone who has manuscript, let them you know, bring it. Their methodology, in addition to memorization, and Zaid himself was a memorizer, was not to accept any claimed manuscript of the Quran unless there are two witnesses testifying to it. That's the minimum. In fact, some ulama interpret that in three ways. Some said means two witnesses that they have heard it with their own ears directly from the mouth of the Prophet Some said it means two witnesses who have seen that being written at the time the Prophet was dictating it. Others said, not necessarily, it could be one and one. So at least there is one written manuscript, another testimony of a memorizer. There are even those who said it meant four because there is reference to writing, reference to memorizing, so that means actually four. But suppose even we take the more conservative one that there were two witnesses at least whatever writing and or memorization of every ayah in the Quran before it was accepted to be part of the collection. But like I said again, all these writings could have been useless so long as the memorization of the Quran is ascertained by multitudes of people around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That uh, original collection, you might say. It was not writing, and I'd like to clarify an issue here, that, that, uh, just coming to that, the question of compilation. That was nothing more than compilation, not writing. And some writers, unfortunately, try to confuse the reader by using terms and expression to the effect of giving the impression that the Quran was not written at the time of the Prophet, it was written at the time of Abu Bakr. This is totally incorrect. To compile something means to bring the already written manuscript, put it together, order it, and arrange it according to the order of the surahs as the Prophet ﷺ explained to them. So this is an issue that has to be kept in mind. It was not writing, it was compiling. That copy remained in the custody of Abu Bakr as Khalifa. After his death, it went to Umar radiallahu an, and after the death of Umar, it remained in the custody of Hafsa uh, radiallahu anha, who was also a widow of the Prophet ﷺ until, I will see later, it was borrowed by Uthman radiallahu an for the copy, uh, for verification of the copy that he sent all over the world. So that gives a, a sort of very brief summary. I'm, I'm leaving many details because, like I said, the topic could be very dry if you get too much uh, uh, branching on that. Now we move to Uthman's time. I try to, again, put it in some simplified form, but we'll add some more points as we go on. First of all, what was the occasion? We know that the occasion of Abu Bakr's effort was to, uh, to make sure that at least in addition to memorizing, there is some authentic uh, codex, as they call it, or written manuscript. How about Osman? What was the occasion? I'll mention something here briefly, which is rather complex, but I just simplify it, and then, uh, inshallah, towards the end of this time, I elaborate more. This is the notion of the so-called ahruf. What does ahruf mean? Some people uh, translate ahruf as qiraat uh, or recitations. This is not strictly correct. This is not correct. Ahruf uh, actually is a reference to the fact that while the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the tongue or dialect of Quraysh, you see, it was all in Arabic, but even in, uh, in Arabia at that time, there were also different tribes. And all of them spoke Arabic, but there are different dialects. For some tribes, uh, one word is totally unknown to them. There would be some equivalent word that would make the meaning clearer to them. Slight variations in expression of the same meaning. The Prophet وسلم, stated, and this is a sound hadith, that Nazal al Quranu. The Quran was revealed on seven. Some interpret that as a, a strictly seven or more. Uh, some say that number seven actually refers to more than one. It doesn't necessarily mean that each and every ayah was revealed in different dialects. But what he meant by that, that for some tribes, 
who might have been unfamiliar or found some of the expressions in the Qurashite dialect with which the Prophet uttered the Quran difficult for them. The Prophet allowed them, but not their own invention, allowed them alternative ahruf or modes of expression as I usually translate, modes of expression to get the same meaning. That's why he used the term actually, فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنْ Read what is easy for you. He, he never meant that to be like something permanent for all time to come. But for that transitional period, the purpose of the Quran is to communicate. Yes, they're all Arabs, but it might be difficult for them in some specific expressions to allow them those alternate uh, expression. Now, even at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, two companions came to him after some dispute happened between them. Because they were very meticulous. Of course, they knew this is the word of Allah. Nobody should have even any letter different. That's the reverence they have for the Quran. So one of them recited one surah, and the other recited, and everybody said, no, your re recitation is wrong, because this is the way I heard it from the Prophet. And he said, no, you're wrong. I heard it also from the Prophet. So they came to the Prophet ﷺ. So he said to the first one, recite. He recited the surah. And the Prophet says, Hakada unzilat. That's how it was revealed. He asked the other one to, re to recite. He recited it with that slight variation also of uh, dialect. And the Prophet said, and that's what, how it was revealed. So he tried to show them that you should not really dispute on that. It's the same meaning. It is something to make it easy for people to comprehend the Quran. Now, this is just a background. How does that relate to what Uthman radiallahu an did? As you know, by the time of Uthman, nearly half of the known world was under Muslim rule. And Muslims went in all kinds of directions, carrying the message of Islam to other lands. But some of the Sahaba that went also belonged to several tribes. So, one time, Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, one of the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ, came back to Uthman, alarmed. Uthman asked him, what's the matter? He said, I have noted in some of, I think it was in Armenia and Azerbaijan, he said, I noted that there's some dispute among the companions. Uh, everybody say, my recitation is better than yours, or my mode of expression is better than yours, even though it's basically the same Quran, but they started disputing. And he said, you should really take a firm position on that issue before they differ on their Quran as the Jews and Christians differed about their scriptures. So what Osman did, he called again Zaid, who was still living, the same chief scribe of Revelation, and he gave him the exact instructions. First of all, he would not work alone. There was a number of companions with him. Number two, that this would, that would be done in public, and I'd come to that point again. It's not something that's secretive behind closed doors. In fact, Osman announced that anyone who had any manuscripts, even those who wrote for their own personal collection, should bring it. And he borrowed also the copy that was already in the house of Hafsa, that was written at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And he asked them to go again through that, collecting verse for verse, or ayah for ayah, uh, getting witnesses, comparing against the original copy, and finally he ordered that several copies would be made of this copy to be sent in the Jama' Mosque, not the one in Toronto here. Uh, Jama' Mosque is a common term that had been used in Masjid al-Jama'. That's the central mosque in several places in the world. Historian mentioned at least uh, four places. Some go as much as seven that were copied directly uh, from uh, that time on. After Uthman, we really noticed two things. One is that he ordered that all unofficial manuscript that has not gone through this collective verification. And notice here, and that's important, verification was both in writing and through memorizers, some of whom have already heard it from the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ, and they were still living at the time of Uthman. Uthman was a companion himself. There were a lot of people who were memorizers, who heard it from the Prophet, in addition to the verification in writing. He said anything that people might have made mistake in writing for their own collection or other dialects even, even if they heard it, even if it was verified but in a different dialect, 
than the dialect of Quraysh. It should be written in the dialect of Quraysh because that's the way the Prophet uttered it because he belongs to Quraysh. So that means that's the original, authentic version or way or mode of expression. I shouldn't say version, actually, mode of expression of the Quran. Like I said, I might come back again to the question of Ahruf, but I thought that we cannot really understand the significance and importance of what Osman did without appreciating the occasion that uh, led to this. Now we can move to the uh, next area. Hoping that you're still awake. Like I said, I did give you a warning before. This is not a, a simple topic. And in spite of all that simplification, it's still, uh, you know, something that requires a, a fair amount of concentration. The first uh, question that some people might say, you say, you people seem to be approaching the Quran in a way that is really different from the so-called uh, high criticism of the Bible. And the problem is really a problem of perception. You see, if you happen to have been a Western scholar belonging to Judaism uh, or Christianity, and when the uh, high criticism began in the 18th, 19th century, continued ever since to verify the authenticity of the Bible, the only way that anything of the Bible, Hebrew scripture or New, script or New Testament, could be verified was nothing but manuscript, something in writing not even original in the original language because there is no complete copy of the gospels for example in the Aramaic the language in which Jesus spoke these are translation we don't know even what the originals were so biblical scholars if they say we want to make an objective research they had absolutely nothing nothing to stand upon except what had can be proven mainly in manuscripts so they go back and say all right what are the oldest manuscripts of the Bible available in museums what archaeological discoveries might confirm or disconfirm, and the debate continues. I think some of you might have seen in recent issues in the Time magazine and others in the last few years, discoveries that negate things or confirm things, because there is no other way of verification. But it is rather uh, uh, curious that a lot of uh, Western scholars and Orientalists who are critics of Islam and critics of the Quran want to impose the exact same methodology on the verification of the Quran in the name of objectivity and free historical uh, scientific research. If, uh, like I said earlier, if all the copies of the Quran were burned down, the Quran would have remained. The Quran would have remained exclusively through memory. In fact, I must add one point that some might not be aware of. Do you know even what kind of script was used in recording the Quran at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Those scripts did not have dots. And you know the dots are very important. If you have just something like this, you wouldn't know whether that is ba if you have a dot underneath, or ta if you have two dots on top, or tha if you have three, or if you have one dot it could be noon. You get my point? Number one, there were no system of dots to distinguish letters. Secondly, there was nothing which is called diacritical remarks. You know, sometimes you get marks on the Quran, like this is Fatha, Kasra, Hamza, Shadda, you know, the various ways which would make a difference in utterance. But what I'm saying here that the Western scholars try to project something which is suitable only for their scriptures, and require that that must be done also in the case of the Quran. Whereas, like I say, even, even if somebody tell you, okay, I can produce, this is impossible, but suppose somebody, I can produce you the entire Quran that was written at the time of the Prophet it would have not been enough to preserve it. Because you didn't know how to pronounce it. B, ba, ta, ta, jim, ha, ha, also is contingent on the dots. What preserved the Quran, what is unique into it, is memorization. And it's only through memorization and through the early people who were really fit, that was their language, that was their bread and butter, that you know exactly how the ayah should be recited. 
But in addition to this, we must say that even if you come to the notion of uh, uh, memorization, which some people find it impossible, how, how could you depend on memory of people to preserve over 6,200 uh, ayahs in the Quran? We notice first of all, number one, that while writing was known among Arabs and after Islam and the writing of the Quran, of course, it became more widespread than before. While writing was known, the majority of Arabs depended on memory, before Islam even, uh, to memorize or preserve their lineage, they depended on memory. History, they depended on memory. Uh, poetry, uh, there's one story, whether it's correct or exaggerated, but it's quite revealing uh, of the strange ability of people to memorize. It says that someone went to his friend, he was a poet, and he told him, look, I got a brand new long poem of 100 verses. Of course, that's a great deal of source of pride to you. So he said, all right, recite it to me. So he started going on through the 100 verses. And the man, his friend said, oh, you're telling me this is new? He said, yes, I just finished it. He said, no, it's not new. I heard it before. He said, I challenge you. So he went reciting the exact 100 verses as they are. He said, no, it's not new. He said, I can't believe it. He said, no, no, it's so common. He called his wife behind the curtain and he said, did you hear about the poem about such and such? He said, yes. He said, what does it say? And she went exactly through the 100 verses. The man got mad. He said, oh, I can get you. My servant, he heard it by now three times and he recited all of them. Of course, the, the, like I said, regardless of authenticity of the story, but it at least carries some essence of the amazing ability of the early uh, Arab. Of course, because their, their obsession with poems and beautiful expression. And when the Quran came to challenge all that eloquence, obviously it really captured their attention uh, very immensely. Number two, the Quran was not like other scriptures. If you look into the uh, comparative religious aspect of it, you find, for example, that the Torah was largely available to the rabbis and the doctors of law. You know, they teach the public, but they are the ones really who keep, you know, the, the law in their hands. If you look at the history of Christendom, for example, you find that even when the Bible was put into writing, uh, usually manuscripts were only available in the hands of the scholars, the priests, the clergy. And as you know, especially in the Catholic, among Catholics until relatively recently, it was not regarded as appropriate for a common Christian, for example, to read the Bible on his own because they said he could get confused or get the wrong message. So he just goes to church, sit, listen to the priest, making selection and teaching them what to say. It was, of course, as you know, Martin Luther, who raised this issue that every Christian should have access to the Bible. It should not be uh, a monopoly of the learned or the priests. But we talk about centuries after that. But the case of the Quran was quite different. The Quran was revealed not in secret, not with a few select companions of the Prophet ﷺ, but wherever he was, traveling, sitting in the battlefield, and everybody's present in the masjid, and everybody's hearing and watching uh, what's taking place. But more importantly, that it became a religious duty on Muslims and a praiseworthy act to memorize the Quran. You go to Bukhari, for example, when we talk about Fada'il al-Quran, a whole chapter on the virtues of the Quran and other books of hadith, and see the amount of ahadith in which the Prophet ﷺ encouraged people to learn the Quran, to teach it to their children, to have their children memorize it. Some of you might remember one of the famous hadith, Khayrukum, من تعلم القرآن وعلمه very eloquent خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه the best of you is one he or she is the one who learns the Quran and teach it to others so that was a source of immense encouragement for all people thirdly and still in spite of what all that you say some people still in the western frame of mind say how could anyone memorize that whole book even at the time of the Prophet. And what they forget, that the Quran was revealed in piecemeal over a period of nearly 23 years. 
a little here and little there. And that makes it a lot easier to memorize than saying, all right, take that whole book, memorize it, and come to tell me in two hours. It, it was all period, a whole period for. Fourthly, unlike the uh, Hebraic law or the Torah or the teaching of the New Testament, uh, which was used, yes, but not really anything that comes closer to the constant use of the Quran in the daily life of the Muslim. The Muslim pray five times a day. And there is always not only the Fatiha, the opening surah of the Quran, there is encouragement of reading beyond that. And of course, they were not like us today, rushing, rushing, Al Fatiha, Qul Allahu Ahad, Allahu Akbar, Qul Farat, Allahu Akbar. These people used to pray. Uh, in much, much longer and elaborate way than most of us are doing uh, today. You find some ahadith, even that in the same rak'ah, you finish Surah Al-Baqarah and go even beyond. Uh, how many of us even can take that? Anyway, so the, um, the Quran was recited every day in prayer, in required prayer. It was recited in nafil prayer, in sunnah, in courage, or non-mandatory prayers. And then we find lots of evidence in sound ahadith in the variety of hadith book that it was the custom of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ to recite the Quran at night. Some spend most of the night reciting the Quran. Look at the significance and implication of this hadith. When the Prophet ﷺ forbade, forbade that you should finish the Quran in less than three days. Suppose even that statement came earlier when the Quran was not completed. Still, it indicates that some people were doing it. That he said, take it easy, no, not less than three days. But again, it encouraged to be, you know, not much more than seven days. And now if, when people finish the Quran in one month or two, they think that they are really doing a good job. So the constant use of it. But the use of the Quran also was not only for prayer or worship or recitation at night or teaching. More importantly, it was for learning how to apply it to their lives. So whenever there was a dispute or problem, and you find that still in books of jurisprudence until today, he says, no, you should not do that, or you should do that, and the evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and then he quotes the ayah from the Quran. It was a reference book for all phases and aspects of the life of uh, the community. But finally, that is something that shocks a lot of people when they know about it. When you tell them, very simple statement, Tell them today, today in the 20th century, in spite of the loss of the eloquence that reached its epic at the time of the Prophet and Sahaba, in spite of the weakness of the memory, we depend on anything now. You know some of you who have kids in the school? You know these calculators? If, if you ask them if he doesn't have calculator, add up 22 and 29, it might take them half an hour. Say, give me a calculator. So the, the memory today has been spoiled with the availability of all this stuff that we have. It might get even weaker. In spite of that big lag, you can find today, not adults, children as young as nine or 10 years old whose mother tongue is not Arabic, is not Arabic, who memorize the entire Quran from A to Z with the exact punctuation, and some people are not aware, non-Muslims in particular, that every year there are various competitions of memorizing the Quran, and some are children. And their language, their mother tongue is not Arabic. They could be Indians, Nigerians, Malaysians, Indonesians, you name it. Let alone those who find it easier even because it's their language and they can understand. No wonder. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated in the Quran, and it was repeated in the same surah so many times, Indeed, we made the Quran easy for remembrance. Is there anyone who heeds it? Today in North America even, let alone the Muslim world, where you get tens of thousands of hafiz, and those brothers and sisters who come from the Indo-Pakistani subcontinent, of course the term hafiz is very common. Someone who memorizes the entire Quran, even though my only reservation that when they lead taraweeh, uh, they read uh, so fast as if a missile is going through without thinking about the meaning. But it shows that they really uh, memorize uh, very accurately and very correctly the entire uh, Quran. 
Now I wonder what, how much we're doing with time. Uh, if we get to the very last one, I'll only choose maybe one or two before I lose track myself even. About the objections, and I left that open because I didn't know which ones were going to um, deal, but with your permission, assuming that you'll, you can keep, keep awaking uh, for a few more minutes, I just address two points. The one that deals with ahruf that we mentioned earlier, not qiraat, ahruf. And related to that issue, of course, in, in a, is an objection that you hear about in written form and speeches by critics of the Quran that Uthman must have burned other versions of the Quran so we don't know really what was there in the Quran. So there were other Qurans in plural and Uthman chose one of those Qurans and burned the other so we don't know really if we have the complete Quran available. This is one issue. The second issue and that they say, all right, even in Hadith literature and in Muslim historical works, there are references to the so-called other codexes. Uh, the codex of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud or Ubay ibn Ka'b, and they said they were not identical. So how come, if you, if you people claiming that there was only one Quran, how come these codexes are already, or codices are acknowledged or in your own uh, historical references? Well, first of all, Let's go back to the issue of the seven, whatever seven is interpreted, the seven modes of expression. Again, this is not recitations. Because you see, in recitation, it's almost like, say, al imala wa takhfif, like when you say, uh, Musa or Musi. You hear sometimes some recitals. Musa or Musi. We talk about the same person, Musa alayhi salam. This is known as qiraat. Okay. But ahruf is not exactly the same, really. So the basic question, they say, all right, if Ahruf is not exactly the same, doesn't that contradict what the, Qur the Quran says, that if the Quran was from any source other than Allah, they would have found many inconsistencies or uh, deviations. But here again, we must say that the Ahruf or different modes of expression of the same meaning or the same ayah does not necessarily mean contradiction of meaning. It is all within what the Prophet ﷺ permitted and all within the meaning of the ayah. Let me give you a few examples. And those who are interested, there was an excellent scholarly article on the subject written by Dr. Muhammad Abdullah Draz, who is one of the foremost scholars of the Quran. It was published uh, some times back, many, many years back, maybe over 20 years in the Islamic horizon. He has a book also uh, uh, about the Quran. I think it's called... Uh, al Zahir al Qur'aniya, something of that nature. Pardon? al Naba Al-Azim, Jazakallah Khair. al Zahir al Qur'aniya is the one by Malik bin Nabi, Muhammad Abdullah Jazz, al Naba Al-Azim is an excellent uh, volume on the subject. But let me just uh, give a few examples. Take one of the um, expressions like as Sirat. In some of the Arabian tribes, they are used to read it with Sad. This is the more common one that we read now. Ihdina sirat al mustaqeen Sad. Some of them are not familiar with this sirat. To them it is as sirat with seen. But both of them refer exactly to the identical meaning. Means the way. Ihdina sirat Another variation that some people use and make lots of noise about that there are different Qur'ans or different versions. Uh, and when the Qur'an speaks, about the Day of Judgment, about what will happen to the mountains. الجبال, huh? What does the word ihn mean in Arabic? Wool. Some tribes are not familiar with that at all. They were allowed to read it as suf. Suf and ihn in English both means wool. This is a sort of alternative way of expression. In some cases you find a difference that doesn't really imply any contradiction. When you read, for example, حَتَّى إِذَا اسْتَيْأَسَ الرُّسُلُ وَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ قَدْ كُذِبُوا When the messengers reach a point of desperation and they think that they have been belied in some of the other modes of expression, ظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ قَدْ كُذِبُوا Which also give the same meaning. 
But again, some of us might wonder, why again was that allowed? Why didn't the Prophet insist on everybody reciting and memorizing the Quran according to the way he expressed it, being a Qurayshayid himself? But like we said earlier, it is something that was needed at that time to make it easy for people, especially for elders. You see, when you get a child to teach them, you can teach them or write the Qurayshayid uh, mode of expression. But how about people who became adult already? How could you, they grasp that in the short time that is available? So the focus in the mind of the Prophet ﷺ, which was also guided by Allah, because this uh, mode of expression, or ahruf, was not his own invention. It was also through Jibreel who allowed some of those variations. So the idea or focus here was to understand the Quran, because the record is already kept in writing and memorization in the tongue of Quraysh as uttered by the Prophet ﷺ. But then the question that some people say, did what Uthman did really constitute interference or destruction of evidence that could have been useful otherwise to discern and examine objectively uh, the preservation of the Quran? And the answer is no. Number one, when Islam spread in different parts of the world, some who accepted, the masses of those who accepted Islam were non-Arabs. What difference does it make for the non-Arab whether you ask them to recite the Quran in this mode or that? Just to, to simplify the question. Suppose you don't know a word of French, okay? You're starting to learn the French language. Does it make much difference to you whether you are taught classical French French or Quebecan style of French? Get my point? It doesn't make any difference for you because you're non-Arab. You, you are, you're, not, you're not French speaking. You're not born uh, with this as your mother tongue. So since the masses of Muslims came from non-Arab source, what Uthman did to direct people towards the way the Prophet uttered the Quran would have not imposed any difficulty on them whatsoever. And as such, he viewed that as a transitional stage until that generation is finished, and then the new generation would all follow the dialect of, uh, of Quraysh. Another aspect is that, and this is very important in terms of scholarly verification of sources also, when it comes to the dialect in which the Prophet uttered the Quran, وسلم, we find that there is so-called tawatur. Tawatur means that it has been confirmed over and over and over again by masses of people because, as you know, the Prophet did not recite it once. Over the 23 years, he leads the prayer, and he recited all the time, and people listening to him. So the confirmation has come through overwhelming evidence, whereas some of those ahruf, or modes of expression, came through what the scholars of Usul call akhbar ahad. That's only through one or a few sources. And obviously, even from the scholarly standpoint, you give much more weight to the ones that has been uh, confirmed with tawatur. Number four, and that's very important. Did Osman radiallahu an take that decision on his own? And do you think that Muslims who believed in the Quran as the word of Allah would have allowed Osman or anyone else to tamper with the word of Allah if indeed there was any secret Qurans that uh, disappeared as a result of the action of Osman? The answer is no. It was made in public. It was made in the presence of memorizers of the Quran. It was made in the presence of even those who brought or wrote down manuscript for their personal use with or without error. And let us remember one thing that is very essential, that the decision was made with the consent of all those who were present. And even some of the Sahaba, as I'll come to later about the codexes, who objected to that and insisted on their own uh, particular manuscript, they came around and agreed ultimately with the decision of Uthman radiallahu an. That leads us to the second question. So what Uthman did, like I said, is not a secret thing, destroy this, uh, hide the evidence, was done in the presence of all. And by the way, like we said earlier, one of the sources he used for verification was the original manuscript that was still in the house of Hafsa, the widow of the Prophet and daughter of Umar radiallahu an. But let me come to the second point, uh, and I think that will be quite enough for now, 
is the issue of codices. Some people say that we hear about um, a copy of the Quran or manuscript that belonged to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, and it says while <coughs> it has uh, basically the same Quran, it is claimed that it did not contain Al-Fatiha and the Mu'waddatain, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Falaq and Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas. The answer to that question, first of all, and that's again the very significant issue of tawatur that seemed to be brushed aside by many biased Western Orientalists. Going back again to the question of usul, if you have a narration that has come through multiple channels and they're all identical, would you give that greater importance or would you give importance to one or two people reporting something different? It's so obvious, even I, I was reading in a book uh, in Christian theology, and while they, that committed Christian himself was writing as a basic rule that they accept in their own theology, he says that you must interpret anything that is really shad or different, quite different, in the light of something which is very bountiful. For example, if, if Prophet Isa alayhi salam, he argues, in s hundreds of statements indicate his humanity, and then there may be some statement that somehow carries possibility of interpretation, you must interpret them in the light of the many, not interpret the many in the light of the few. That's a very simple rule of logic and theology whether it applies to Islam or others. So this issue must be brought to mind also. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is a great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Okay? Suppose, and by the way, there are some scholars who dispute even that riwayah, dispute that indeed Abdullah ibn Mas'ud did not include al-Fatiha and Mu'adhatain. And these are well-known scholars in verification. Ibn Hajar and Nawawi and Ibn Hazm are very important names among historians and scholars of Hadith. And all of them uh, believe that this narration about the codex of Ibn Mas'ud is weak. But I'm going even beyond that. Suppose it were not weak. Number one, how do we know that Al-Fatiha is part and parcel of the Quran? Through one or two or three sources? It is absolute tawatur. There is no single Muslim, past or present, including Ibn Mas'ud himself, who did not memorize Al-Fatiha. It's well known that it's part of the pillars or the essential prerequisite for the validity of prayers. So whether, it, even if it were true, whether he lost that page or for some reason, or did not put it because everybody memorized it. Furthermore, you talk about Mu'waddatain at the end of the Quran. Even if you say that he might have not might have lost a manuscript. Suppose he didn't write it even. Everybody memorized that and there is, there are numerous sound ahadith of the Prophet about Mu'awazatain. Ma sa'ala sa'ilun bimislihima wa lasta'adha musta'idun bimislihima. That there are lots of talk about the Mu'awazatain and it comes also by tawatur through uh, numerous uh, sources. So this is something again that one has to keep in mind. Uh, one more thing before concluding. Some people say, or try to exploit, to exploit the difference uh, of understanding about imama between uh, Muslim Sunnis and Shias, and say, look, in some of the polemical writings, uh, it is uh, claimed that there is a different Quran for the Shia. You know, all these kind of polemical things, that there were other surahs in the Quran that Uthman uh, suppressed because they speak favorably about Ali and his uh, eligibility to be the Khalifa after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the claim is made that some of the Quran was lost, suppressed by Uthman, or something was added in order to support one political view or theological view uh, or the other. You might have heard also, those of you who have read in the subject, that there was a surah called Surah Al-Wilaya a special surah in the Quran speaking about Ali's wilaya that he should be the leader of Muslims. Now, there are four basic responses to that before I finish. One, that this kind of claims are batil, batil, batil. They are false, false, false. You go today to Iraq in Shia area. You go to Iran, a stronghold of Shiaism. Uh, in India, 
or any place in the world. Personally, I have never seen the so-called Shiite Quran. And if any brother or sister here who follow the Shia interpretation can tell me, and I would welcome to hear that, if they have ever seen the so-called Shia Quran that is different. Is there anyone here by show of hands? Anyone who so-called saw the Shia Quran, where is it? Why is it not in the marketplace? It is a myth to speak about the so-called Shia Quran. It is an exploitation of difference between Muslims about the concept of imama to try to widen the gap and create myth or to use writings that might have been written by some Shiite writers, but there, you know, there are polemical writings on both sides that is not something that one should give a serious scholarly attention to. Number one. Number two, one of the greatest Shiite scholars is known as At-Tabrasi. In his famous volume known as Majma' al-Bayan, he says, and I quote him in Arabic first, أَمَّا الزِّيَادَةُ فِي الْقُرْآنِ فَمُجْمَعٌ عَلَىٰ بُطْلَانِهَا وَأَمَّا النُّقْصَانِ فَأَشَدُّ اسْتِحَالَةً Which means, as far as anything that was added to the Qur'an, there is ijma', there is unanimity that this is false. And as far as reducing or removal of anything, نُقْصَان, diminishing from the Qur'an, it is even more impossible. And these are the words of one of the main pillars of Shiite theology. Number three, the question that I raised earlier. Ali radiallahu an and other people, other Sahaba, contemporaries of the Prophet sallam, very powerful figures, were there already. Would they allow Uthman or anyone else to tamper with what they believe is the word of Allah that must be preserved intact? It's an impossibility. We don't hear about this. And even some of those rebels who ultimately murdered Osman radiallahu an, when they raised some issue, it was only just to try to gain some support. We said, Ghayyar al-Quran, but they could not offer a single iota of evidence against Osman that he tampered with the Quran. It was not Osman's decision. It was a collective decision of the ummah that let's not divide, even on the modes of expression, keep it exactly as uttered by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which brought a great unity in the Muslim Ummah until today. To the point that one of the non-sympathetic Muslim, uh, non-Muslim scholars, William Muir, M-U-I-R, after going through a very critical analysis, very critical of how the Quran was preserved, he concluded finally, he said we can say that the Quran we have today, that means all over the Muslim world, get any copy anywhere published or printed at any time, manuscript, in any point of history, it is all the same. He said we can say, as a non-Muslim, that the Qur'an we have today is almost, we might say, the same. He, he, the truth is very difficult to utter it. He doesn't want to say it even openly. He says almost, but maybe you can say the same as the manuscript of Osman. His main difficulty, as I indicated in my humble little test, by the way, for those who are interested in the subject, album seven of the Islamic teaching series all deal with the question of sciences of the Qur'an. And it was quoted there, that what, what I said that uh, uh, Moir uh, was not as objective by trying to cut the connection between the manuscript written under the supervision of the Prophet that was collected by Abu Bakr and Uthman as if they, something happened in between. But at least he could admit openly that the nuskha or the copy of Uthman is the same as utter uh, the same as we have today. But then there is tremendous evidence that it is exactly the same also as written at the time of the Prophet and compiled by uh, Abu Bakr. And finally, very simple logic, logical question. If indeed anyone tampered with the Quran, removed any part pertaining to Ali radiallahu an, dropping or adding, do you realize that Ali radiallahu an himself was Khalifa for six years and has full power? He was the Khalifa. Yes, there were troubles like other Khalifa. There were wars going on, disputes and commotions. But why that so-called hidden Quran or hidden surahs of Wulaya of others never appeared? He has every authority to publish and even burn all copies that Osman sent to the Amsar or to the cities. Finally, one point only for the sake of connecting between this and another very curious and important topic. 
very interesting one, an, an indirect one that sometimes when you tend to think about the authenticity of the Quran, you keep focusing in depth on preservation and by memory, by writing, codices and so on. But there is something very simple and very logical. Many of you are familiar with the literature that came up in recent times about the Quran, the Ajaz, the miracle of the Quran, not from the standpoint of historical or archaeological argument, but from purely scientific, decisive, known science, not scientific theories, f established facts of science. And you're lucky here in Toronto that you have, of course, Dr. Keith Moore, and some of you must have seen his lectures about the amazing precise expression in the Quran about human embryology, even genetics, a science that developed only in recent decades that shows that indeed the Quran could have not been written by human. My question here is this, aside from the argument on the issue that we didn't deal with today, the authority of the Quran, the evidence that it is impossible that Prophet Muhammad wrote that or any human because these are scientific inf inventions that we only learned recently. Aside from that line of argument, my question is very simple. If indeed there was the slightest tampering in the words of the Quran, how come these amazing discoveries are known today? In other words, if somebody tampered with the Quran, and then the ayat in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Surah 23, that deals with the embryonic stages, or ayat that gives a clear indication about genetics, that it is the sperm of the man that determine the uh, sex of the fetus, not the, the egg, which is established in genetics now. If there was the slightest uh, tampering, would we have that precise expression in the Quran today? So that could be another issue that you can go on and research and relate it actually to the issue of authenticity. In conclusion, I must apologize to you that in a way before I gave that talk, I asked my brothers for some advice I said if the kind of audience we have today is the kind of audience that is looking mainly for uh, general inspirational talk, no problem. I could have talked about Salah, and we have some slides also about some aspect of Salah. If, however, uh, there is uh, a high degree of seriousness and interest, then perhaps we can try to touch on a topic as complex and as deep as this topic. And the advice I got that, alhamdulillah, the audience is very receptive and very um, attentive. And I could testify that I hardly heard anyone really snoring. Or I might have seen a couple of cases of people getting a little bit astounded by the uh, information. But alhamdulillah, I am grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you were able to go through this very uh, laborious uh, type of uh, presentation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it useful. And if some of you at least felt it is too dry, I seek only your forgiveness for one reason, that uh, in recent decades, and especially in last few years, with the constant attempt to destroy Islam and Muslims, uh, we find various means of destruction. There is first the destruction of Muslims physically through genocide, as we have seen in occupied Palestine, and in Bosnia, in uh, India, in Kashmir, other places in Cambodia, and, um, and, and uh, uh, Burma, former Burma, uh, we see one attempt to destroy Muslims or liquidate them physically. But what is even more dangerous and serious and very relevant to Muslims living in the West here that I can see because I'm interested in that area. I see in literature, in the uh, kind of speakers that are going around the country giving lectures to churches and other places in talk shows, so books, uh, talks, videos, that there is an attempt also to destroy Islam by dis attacking the credibility of its prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They realize that Muslims are awfully lucky by having a book which is both authoritative and authentic that there was no tempering, which is unparalleled in human history or any religious faith. So they want to attack both the authority and authenticity of the Quran. And if I had time, I could have given you more examples of the so-called errors of science in the Quran, errors of grammar in the Quran. There are lots of all kinds of 
uh, uh, unjustified and erroneous critiques, unobjective, it appear objective, but it's really unscientific and unobjective attacks on the authority and authenticity uh, of the Quran and through attacking its own teaching that it's old fashioned or cruel or whatever. Uh, so uh, I believe that while the topic I admit is even less interesting for some or less or more dry than dealing, for example, with the authority of the Quran. How do we know it is the word of Allah, which is still uh, an elaborate topic, but perhaps a little bit more uh, uh, easy to follow. I believe, however, that it might be useful uh, for some at least and might at least generate some interest on the part of some of you. That's why I'd like to conclude by uh, mentioning some of the reflections. I did mention, but that should be at the last, the very end of the list. But for something that might be readily available is album seven, six and seven actually of the Islamic teaching series where you have uh, a total of 32 hours of taping all about the Quran. The first part is on uh, authority. The other one is authenticity and sciences. But uh, for those who read Arabic, uh, the uh, best source in my judgment, contemporary source in terms of scholarship and response to some of the orientalist claims is the one written by the, another martyr, a Sheikh, uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, uh, Subh Saleh. Dr. Subh Saleh is a great Lebanese scholar who wrote two important volumes. One is called Mabahith Fi Ulum Al Quran. Mabahith is not like some people in Egypt believe, like uh, security service. Mabahith means uh, research or areas of research pertaining to the sciences of the Quran. And another one is another Mabahith in the sciences of hadith. This is an excellent source uh, on the topic. Um, in terms of um, relatively recent ones, the book by Az Zurqani, it's called Ajaz uh, al-Quran, uh, if I remember the title correct, is a very important source on that. Among the earliest writings which has been quoted frequently by many writers is uh, Jalal al-Suyuti, again on Ulum al-Quran, sciences of the Quran. I'm not trying to say that this, these are the only ones, at least these are ones that I'm familiar with that really have great importance and uh, wealth of information. Uh, for those who uh, do not read Arabic, it is unfortunate that you don't have as many translated because like I said, the topic is very hard itself. Uh, the, among Muslim as public, very few are aware of many of those aspects. And among people even who specialize or study in that area, there are not too many because of the difficulty of the topic itself and some technical elements involved. However, a simplified and reasonable source is written by a German Muslim who accepted Islam. Um, it's called Ulum al-Quran. Ulum al-Quran. Uh, SubhanAllah, I'm becoming old, forgetting names. His name is... Uh, Ahmed von Denfer, exactly. Den Venfer, D E N Denfer, von Denfer, V O N, and the last name Denfer, D E N double F E R. That's a good uh, book also on the subject. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may enable me sometimes just to, uh, not as a alim, but as a student, ulama, to compile uh, some of this information, which is already actually on the tapes, but to put it also in some uh, uh, written form. So my apology again, and I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may make some benefit of this extremely lengthy presentation. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We don't have time to be falling into petty disputes between individuals. And you don't really believe until you love each other. Don't waste your lives away. All of it. I'm talking to myself. Don't be insignificant people. Be great people. Courtesy, we should have courtesy and other to each and everyone. Otherwise, Islam without this is no Islam.